Welcome to the Portland Pentecostals podcast. We're happy you've decided to join us as we build a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. Enjoy the message. Tonight, we're going to try to finish this up. We may not finish this up, uh, but we're going to be talking about dominion over circumstance. And uh, what we want to review is a little bit what happened last week. And and we've got to know who we are. We've got to know the power that we have through the name of Jesus and the power of his influence. We understand that if we don't have this understanding, the enemy will oppress us, he will torment us, and he will use circumstance to control you and I. So what we want to do is we want to limit his influence. And Luke chapter number 10 and verse number 19 is a passage that we concluded, well, it was the second to the last verse that we read last week, and it reads this way, Behold, I have given unto you authority to, and power to trample on serpents and scorpions and physical and mental strength and ability over all the power of the enemy that possesses, that the enemy possesses, and nothing shall in any way harm you. So thank God for that power that you and I have and that he promises that nothing shall by any means harm you. So that's a gift that God has given to you and I, the ability to stand strong and say, enemy, it doesn't matter what you throw at me, I have the power over what you throw at me. So we just need to learn how to use that power. And we concluded with Psalm chapter number 91 And I gave you an assignment to read Psalm chapter number 91. And hopefully you read that because it talks about the opposition that came in the life of King David. And I lifted a couple of verses out of there. Verses 5 and 6 of Psalm 91 says, You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. So he said, you shall not be afraid. In other words, he said, you really don't have any reason to be afraid. Just get over it. Get beyond the fear. And I know, we know that's a struggle sometimes. We have to talk ourselves off the ledge. We've got to talk ourselves out of this fear that is happening in our life. Because there are things that do cause anxiety in our life. We see circumstances piling up that last time those circumstances came, we fell or we fell short or we sinned or we backed away from God and there was a cooling off period. And so when those things begin to stack up, it makes me nervous because I can see the handwriting on the wall. But it also lets me know if I'm aware enough to see those things happening, then I can avert the failure, or I can avert uh, the weakness, or I can find some stage in that process where I can say, no, that's not going to happen. It's going to be different this time. So he said, you will not be afraid. I'm so glad for the Holy Ghost that we have. I'm so glad for that love of God that casteth out all fear. Sometimes I just need to pray until the Holy Ghost is flowing through me freely and just keep praying that way. And then the love of God absorbs or casts out all of that fear. And it shakes it away from me. So he said, don't worry. There's going to be pestilence at darkness. And there is going to be destruction that wastes at noonday. It's not coming through to you probably. Okay, well, we'll just go with it. So we're going to go to the next passage of scripture. We're going to be talking about Gideon. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this slide presentation off. And we're going to go to the eighth chapter of Judges is where all of this is happening. And God calls Gideon. And uh, we need to understand that when God has a plan, it always works as he designed it to work if we work the plan. So God has uh, uh, seen that the nation of Israel is in trouble. The Midianites have gathered and for seven seasons or seven years, they have oppressed uh, the Israelites. And and, uh, when the, the sheep 
and the cattle uh, calved and gave their lambs, they would come in, and once they got strong enough and weaned, they'd steal all of the fresh flocks and herds. When they would harvest the grain, they would either take it before they winnowed the grain or they would wait until they had winnowed the grain and stored it and then they would come in and steal the grain. They had taken all of their weapons away and they had hauled all of the blacksmiths away out of the country so that there was no way that they could make weapons for themselves. But God calls Gideon from his work. And this is important to understand is God doesn't tell us to just sit around and wait for things to happen. Uh, uh, He uses people that are doing something. And Gideon was working. He was threshing wheat in the wine press. In other words, he was hiding down in this wine press where maybe it was five feet deep that on his tippy toes he could get up or he could chin up and he could look over there. And he had to be aware and he was beating the grain, the barley, so that it would uh, uh, produce uh, its seeds so that they could maybe make some meal, make some bread so they could feed themselves. And God comes along, the angel of the Lord, and he says, Hey, thou mighty man of valor, and we're not going to get stuck on all the details uh, of Gideon's story, but he looks over his shoulder like it's somebody else. Uh, But God is calling Gideon as he sees him, as who he is, not as who Gideon thinks he is. That's what attracted us, us to God somewhat, is he called us and he said, I love you, you're lovable. You're forgivable. We didn't think we could be forgiven or we didn't think we could love, be loved and we didn't think maybe we could res- be restored and be made healthy. But God sees us that way and God calls him and he asks him, okay, uh, you know what, uh, I want you to uh, make a barley cake and I want you to offer it to me and realize that this was precious, this barley cake uh, that he offered and, and there he offered it on a stone and fire came up out of the stone and it consumed the sacrifice. And uh, uh, it's interesting that God would ask for so much from Gideon. It was a big thing. God doesn't, well, he does ask for little things, but always somewhere in all of our lives, God asks us a big ask. It's something we say, well, that's tough, God. That's hard. We're going to preach on some of that Sunday. But Jesus didn't shirk away. He pushed back and didn't want to go to Calvary, but he made the ultimate sacrifice by going to Calvary. It's not like his flesh wanted to or it was easy. He did what was hard so that we could have forgiveness of sins. And so then even after the sacrifice is consumed, we see the ongoing saga of the story of Gideon. And he says, oh, if you really called me, I'm going to lay this fleece out, this piece of sheepskin out. And in the morning, if it's wet and everything else is dry, I'll know you talk to me. And then he goes, wait a minute, that's the way it normally would work. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to lay the fleece out there and I want everything else to wet, be wet. And I want this to be dry. And he did that. And God answered him. Now, that's the mercy of God. Understand this, is God is pretty patient. (laughs) He knows how to talk to you and me. He knows who needs to be sweet-talked, and he knows who needs to be kind of shook a little bit. He knows who needs, he says, hey, I need to talk to you, and others will say, hey, you, we need to talk. And God understands that. He was generous enough to answer this man. And uh, he told him what he had to do. He had to do difficult things. He went down and he, he destroyed the altar of Baal that it was his father's altar. And he cut down the grove of Baal so that they couldn't rebuild the altar in that place. And uh, he gave sacrifice to God on an altar that he built to Jehovah God. And he called the warriors in. And he said, come. We're going to go fight against these Midianites. God is going to give us the victory. We are going to overcome. And 32,000 men gathered together. 
They were tired of what was going on, but we know that over a process of time, God told them, hey, uh, uh, tell all the guys that are scaredy cats to go home, and 22,000 of the 32,000 went home, and, and then he has a water test, and uh, he, he takes them to the water, and, uh, and uh, out of those, 9,700 of them are sent home because only 300 passed the water test. And every major thing in the scripture, there's a water test, just like they were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and we've got to be willing to go to the watery grave and take on the name of Jesus and, and die out to our flesh and say yes to him. But this is what part of the beautiful part of the story is that God allows Gideon a glimpse into the mindset of what's going on in the Midianites. You see, we can't read the mind of the enemy, but our God knows what he's thinking. Uh, we can't see everything in the whole picture, but God sees the end from the beginning. And he knows when you need another nudge, or he knows when you need a prophetic utterance, or he knows when you need to pick up a scripture and read it and be strengthened by the word of God. And Gideon had the plan. They were supposed to be there, and each one of them was supposed to have a lantern that was lit, and they'd put a clay pitcher over the top of it. And then there were some guys with trumpets. Uh, uh, they all had trumpets and they were told these 300 men, hey, when the time comes, you're going to break the the pitcher and you're going to let the light shine forth and you're going to blow the trumpet and you're going to say the sword of the Lord in of Gideon. So Gideon had all this plan. By the way, each one of those guys would have been a captain of at least a thousand. So to the enemy, it looked like there were leaders of 30,000, but there were only 300. But what is it to, for God to save with few or with many? Because this is a miracle. This is a God thing. It's what God is doing. We needed a miracle to be saved. It was a miracle that we repented. That we lost our ego and our pride. And we crawled back to God and said, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. The first time, for some of us, when we backslid, it was a miracle that we found the humility or the courage to come back to God and kneel before him because we didn't know if we were worthy. Well, you're no more unworthy the second time than you were the first time. And God has an investment uh, in those that have been born again of the water and the spirit. Uh, and God doesn't like it when his investment doesn't pay off. Just read the parables of the talents. <laughs> he says, no, I'm going to get everything I can out of that. God's going to squeeze it out. He's going to get you. He's going to save you. And so Gideon has all the plan, but he just one more time, he thinks he'll go down into the camp of the Midianites and there he can he see uh, the, the fires and he can hear through the tent wall and one of the Midianites is saying to the other, hey man, I had this dream and I, I saw this big old barley cake roll down off the mountain and come through our camp and utterly destroy our camp. And again, our sacrifice is little. It's like we give God 10% and he says, that's all right, I'll take care of the rest and I'll make sure you have all your need. This man, he gave a sacrifice. It wasn't a tithe, but it was an offering to God. He gave that barley cake that could have fed him and God grew what he gave to him. See, if we keep it in our hands, eventually we spend it all. But if we give it to God, he can grow it. He can take you from nothing to everything you have need of if you'll just place in your hand what he has given to you. And it might seem like it's the last and, and that's all there is. But it was when Jesus gave up the last breath that he was able to say, it is finished. And that last breath was enough. And there... One of the Midianites interprets the other Midianites and says, that's nothing but the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And their hearts failed them. Kind of like the people of Jericho whose hearts had melted for fear. And for 40 years, they were scared to death of the Israelites. Well, they're just a few miles away on the other side of Jordan. And people are dying. And they're giving, getting anxiety about going into Canaan's land. Well, the enemy's anxious too. 
And our enemy knows that his days are numbered. He knows that there is an end in sight. And so sure enough, they follow the plan of God in the middle of the night in the darkness. They break the pitchers and let them shine forth and blast on the trumpets and the sword of the Lord and of Gideon and the kings are, that are in the valley run away, but the men begin to be slain. But then they chase the kings from the land and, and the kings lock themselves in a cave to hide themselves and they leave them there and they keep chasing the enemy until they chase them all the way out of the land and then they come back and unseal the caves uh, and the, the cave that was supposed to be their protection uh, becomes the grave uh, of those kings and they win a great victory but along with that during the time when Gideon is seen as a great hero and the victories begin to come then the play, guys that were afraid came back and others came back uh, and they followed along and they won a great victory Seven years of waiting. I am so thankful that in God's time, everything happens. Anything is possible. They were saved supernaturally by God's plan with the help of God's man in God's timing. So when God says it's enough, it's over. And the enemy is just waiting for his demise. In your life and my life, we face battles. We battle our ego. We battle our sensual desires. We battle our old habitual self that wants to go back to where we used to live. We battle, battle in our mind a sense of, of failure or a sense of inadequacy. Or we can overcome in our mind the battle really really begins right here. And we understand that when Christ died on Calvary, he destroyed all the power of the enemy. He said, I came to destroy the works of the devil. He didn't say I came to suppress him. He said, I came to destroy it. And sure enough, you know, it wasn't until after Jesus rose again and he was standing on the Mount of Ascension, he said, Behold, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Before that, he says, the words that I speak, they're not mine, they're his. The deeds that I do, they're not mine, they're his. But now he's saying, I got it all. Why? Because he went to death for your sin and my sin. But the beauty of that is, is now he has shared that power with you and me. Some would think it would be egotistical to speak and say to the Satan, hey, I got more than what you got. Well, it's scriptural. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Say, so, devil, you can't have me. I'm covered by the blood. I'm filled with the spirit of God. You know what would be arrogant? It's to not do that. Because basically we're saying, Jesus, your sacrifice wasn't enough. It wasn't worth it. It's not adequate for me. But I'm going to humble myself uh, under the hand of God. In due time, he'll exalt me. I'm going to resist the devil and he'll flee. I'm going to draw nigh to God and he's going to draw nigh to me. But the point of danger isn't always in the battle. Sometimes it's in the success. And Gideon's greatest point of danger came at the apex of his success. After the battle, they wanted to make him a king. And he says, no, 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 I'm not going to be a king. And they wanted him to rule. And he said, no. And so he says, just give me a reward. And so they brought to him gold earrings, 43 pounds. This was a, uh, just a, uh, not today's price, but close to it, $627,000. Not bad, huh? That's at today's prices. So they, they gave him enough to set him up for life. And they added pendants and crescents and jewels. And they brought royal garments. And Gideon sewed the earrings to an ephod. And the people began to worship the ephod. So here's a guy that God took out of a, a, a wine press. And he used a, a humble man. But now the arrogance comes over him. And that's when I have to be careful is that, oh, now I'm somebody. I'm invincible. We just cast out devils yesterday. I'm somebody. 
No, it's God in you that somebody. It's God that worketh in us both to will and to do his good pleasure. So I'm telling you, when you're in tough times, at least you know you're in a fight. Uh, sometimes it's in the good times when we get lazy. It's like David, when, and at the times when kings go out to war, David was in his house just relaxing. And that's when he fell and he sinned with Bathsheba and he sinned against Uriah and he sinned against God. Judges chapter number 8 and verse number 27 says, and his riches became a snare to him. So Gideon made, uh, it, where'd you get that? Okay, you have my scriptures anyway. And all Israel played the harlot in with it there and it became a snare to Gideon into his house so they gave glory to the wrong source so when we win a victory it's all God Amen. it's not me when you and I lay hands on somebody and they receive the Holy Ghost it's because we obeyed and laid hands on them and they shall lay hands on them and they'll receive the Holy Ghost when we pray for the sick it says we'll anoint them and the prayer of faith shall save the sick and if they have committed any sin they shall be forgiven them the gold and the glory got to Gideon trials will come and extremes will happen but again, I say to us, sometimes the biggest danger is when we're comfortable. The American church has been pretty comfortable till recently. <laughs> it's like we're not as needy financially as many in the world. I asked a friend one time who served overseas, I said, how come people get the Holy Ghost so easy and there's so many miracles and so many provisions? He said, because that's all they got is God. Yeah. <laughs> he said, so if you're praying for more miracles, guess what? <laughs> you're praying, God, take it all. <laughs> so I need more miracles. Now, we want the miraculous, and we have seen the miraculous provision of God and the healing and the deliverance come from Him. 1 Peter 4 and 12 says in the New King James, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you, verse 13, but rejoice to the extent that you partake in Christ's sufferings, that when His glory is revealed... You may also be glad with exceeding joy. Remember we read, I the Lord send the rain on the just and the unjust. It, it's just the way it is. Some things are just life. But I am so glad that when fiery trials come, as long as it's for righteousness sake, I know God's going to be with me. He's going to walk with me through those struggles. And if you and I would just sit around and talk today, we could all tell of places where we went right to the ragged edge. And we almost lost our soul, or we almost lost our possessions, or we almost lost our health completely, or our sanity. And, but in time, God showed up, and He brought deliverance. I read again from Psalm 91, this time from verse 7. A thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. So all of this swirling is happening around David, but he says, it can't harm you. You're going to see it. You're going to feel it. You're going to watch others fall. You're going to see disaster. You're going to see calamity. But it can't come near you. Why? Because God is on our side and we're on his side. And that's just as important as he being on our side. Paul said to the church at Philippi in chapter 4 and verse 12, Not that I speak in regard of need, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am in there to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound everywhere and in all things. Uh, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, to abound and to suffer need. He said, I learned. Yes. So it's a process, isn't it? Yeah. It's, just, it's like, it isn't fun to be needy, but you learn how 
to suffer and you learn how to have humility and you learn to let go. You learn to open your hands and give to God. And I'm not just talking about finances. God asks you, some of you, to give up things that he doesn't ask your neighbor in the church to give up. Because he wants the thing that you want the most. To be in his hand. Now he might give it right back to you. Once you have given it up to him. You release it to him. But the Bible says. That if we'll give it all to him. If we'll follow him. He told his disciples. You'll get tenfold. And in this, in this life. And in the life to come. Everlasting life. God says. I'll give it back to you. Circumstances must not control us or define us. We can make sure they don't by first controlling our flesh. And we talked about that just a, a couple weeks ago about saying no to the flesh. But we also have to surrender to him. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. And that's right on the tails of him saying, I know I've learned how to be abased and I've learned how to bow. I've learned to suffer need and I've learned to have plenty. I learned that. So serving God is not for the weak. It's not for wimps, is it? Boy, just stick around a while. And I'm not trying to discourage anybody, but I'm trying to have truth and packaging to say, guess what? If you want it all, you got to give it all up. If you want to be closer to God, you got to resist the devil more and more. You got to say no to your own fleshly desires and yes to the will of the Spirit. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 14, Paul would later say, but thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. And basically Paul is saying, you know, when struggle comes and I overcome, they smell God. Because that's not me. You know, there's some things, it's only when you crush them, you, you smell them. You, you can maybe smell that mustard seed, but you squeeze it in your thumbs and poof. Some things are really, really strong because it got crushed. That's what makes the anointing oil so precious. It's crushed and it's ground and it's mixed. And that's what gives its fragrance. So the key to success is not circumstantial. It's relational. I've used an illustration before, and I, I just, you know, it's a little boy thing, I think. I, I don't ever remember my sisters doing this, but I can remember standing at the crack in the sidewalk and looking at Lanny Lucera and say, this is my property, and if you step over it. Anybody ever been territorial like that? Yeah. The, pro the problem was, is I had a pastor that told the story that when he was a kid, he, he knocked a guy clear into the next county because they were standing on the county line. And so he said, you hit me, I'm going to knock you into the next county. And that sounded really good to a little boy, you know, because, and if they stepped over, I had rights to hit them. If they hit me first, I could hit them back. <laughs> but it, when, when it really escalated, I'd say, well, my dad's tougher than your dad. And I'm sure that uh, Pat Lucera and Harold Hansen didn't have a clue what was going on, and they didn't want to fight each other. But Lanny and Steve were standing at the property line, dueling it over and daring one another. And so when it got to where it escalated, eventually it was relational as my dad's bigger than your dad. 
But really, that's the way it is in our spiritual world. It's not who we are necessarily. It's whose we are. It's who we belong to. It's that he lives in us. And he has given us access to his name. And he has given us the covering of his blood. He has given us the authority of his word to use. And so our victory and our triumph really is relational. And I'm going to read a passage of Scripture very quickly that is important to you and I, Romans 8 and 37. Yet in all things we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature created things shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's not about Him being separated from our love, but it's about us not being separated from Him. It's about His love and how strong it is. So when you fall out of love with Him, He still loves you. When you backslide, He's still married to you. That's what the scripture says. I love him so much because he first loved me. And he outloves me any day, any way, any time. And we're not here to confess our faults or our sins to each other. But oh, if we knew what went on in the minds and the hearts of our brothers and sisters, we might grit our teeth and wonder that they're even here in the house of the Lord. But the key is is staying connected to him, is coming to him and saying, no, uh, you hang on to me. You keep loving me, God. I'm going to do my best to love you, but I can't outlove you. I can't outgive you. I can't outrun you. You're married to me. We've got to, though, fall in love with Jesus. And, and as I age, I understand that even more. The power of love. Love has got to be the greatest power that there is available. The the scripture says, and the greatest of these is love. I'll probably read it next weekend to remind Natanya that she better love that blonde head as God. (laughs) But the greatest is love. (laughs) Because love will cause us to forgive when we don't feel like it. Love will uh, make us show up at dinner when we... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> really feel ashamed by how we acted. But the love of God. And I wonder at a love of a mother and a father for their children until I had children. Then it's understandable, isn't it? Uh, you know, we used to say, you're ugly and your mother dresses you funny. It's like, you have a face only a mother could love. I mean, nobody else ever said that. I'm probably the only one that ever did. (laughs) But we were drawing a parallel and we're saying, only a mother could love you. Because there's something about a mother's love. And we could really say, God loves you. And sometimes we were so unlovable, it seemed like nobody else could love us but God. I don't know if you've ever had one of those attitude days where it's only God. (laughs) Forget your kids, forget your spouse, forget anybody else. You just had one of those bad attitude days. But God continues to love. Because nothing will separate us from the love of God. You know, God doesn't believe in divorce. And I'm not trying to pick on people's personal relationships. But he he says, no, no, you're going to have to walk out on me. If you want to see a real picture of the love of God, you go read the writings of the prophet. and You'll find out, you know, Hosea, you know. He says, I want you to get married to this prostitute. I mean, what would your mom and dad say? I mean, they were opposed just because he wasn't rich. You know, or whatever. The parents can have these standards. But God says, I want you to do this because I want Israel to see how I feel about them. Yes. And you're going to show them how I feel about them by the way that you act. You see, that's why God wants us to live the way we live. is so that the world can see his love. 
He wants us to love our neighbor as ourselves, not for our benefit, but for their benefit and their, his relational benefit with them. That they would see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. And if you read through the book of Hosea, you'll see, man, he eventually had to go or buy her back from auction. And God said, see, Israel, I love you so much, it doesn't matter what you do. I, I'm going to make sure you come home with me. God's doing his best to make sure you make it all the way home. What about you? What are you doing to invest in this relationship? We must protect that relationship and become intimately attached with him. And in a couple of weeks, I'm going to teach about that. That's some of the reason why we draw boundaries in our life is to protect our relationship with Jesus Christ. And sometimes we don't understand boundaries that are given to us, but we learn the longer we live why we need those boundaries. And again, it's that lead up we talked about just a little bit earlier. We can see everything piling up and we can get fearful that we're going to fail again. But as long as you learn to stop it sooner and sooner each time, eventually you'll just see a flash bang and you'll go, okay, we're not even going there now. We're not going down that road. Life wasn't easy for the early New Testament believers. I used to say, I wish I was alive when Jesus was here on this earth, but I don't know if I'm man enough. Paul put it this way in 2 Corinthians 11. Here's his resume. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more, in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, and deaths often. From the Jews five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeys often in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of Gentiles, in perils of the, in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. <laughs> just, uh, oh, wow. I'm having a rough day, God. You know what? Somebody cut me off. I'm just done. And I know I go through some of those cycles and have to apologize to God and say, I'm sorry. I need to draw my attitude back in. Somehow in all these, he said, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. He learned in all of this. But then he makes a statement in 2 Corinthians 4 and 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. He says, life is not easy, but don't worry. You won't be crushed. You won't be in despair. You won't be forsaken. And you won't be destroyed. No wonder, he said, nothing will separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Listen to the promise that God made to Israel in Deuteronomy 4 and 30. When you are in distress in all the things that come upon you in the latter days, when you turn to the Lord your God and obey his voice, for the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not forsake you, nor destroy you, nor forget the covenant of your fathers which he swore to them. He said that about a temporary covenant, about the old covenant. How does he feel about the new covenant? He has placed his spirit within us, and he's not going to take it away. David put it this way in Psalm 37 and 39, but the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble, and the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust in him. It's all about him. You're not strong enough, but in Christ, all things are possible. I'd like for you to stand just to remind me it's time to quit. 
But I'm going to go quickly through a few more passages of Scripture. It's a passage of Scripture that has always grabbed my attention. Isaiah 40, and I'm going to read verse 31, but I'm going to read it out of the Amplified Version. It's usually we hear, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as the eagle. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Listen to the way the Amplified Version puts it. But those who wait for the Lord, who expect, look for, and hope in Him, shall change and renew their strength and power. They shall lift up their wings and mount up close to God as eagles mount up to the sun. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. It's interesting. I looked up the word wait. It's kava. He says, they that wrap themselves around God. So the key is, is we're going to hang on to God. That means to be bound together. Yes, there's a lot of things that are bound together in the bundle of life. But if we'll be bound together with God, he'll make sure that they fly out like arrows when the time comes. When the stress is there and you've passed the test, God will just... Isn't that interesting that sometimes we pray and we don't know what the click point was, but all of a sudden it's like, I'm not worried anymore. Or God provided. And me, my analytical mind, I want to point to the when, what, where, how, and why. But this is a walk of faith. This is a life of trust. 1 Timothy 2 and 1 says, Therefore I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. One of the keys is prayer. Supplication is prayers for averting evil of every kind. Deliver us from evil. But prayer is for obtaining good things, both spiritual and temporal, for ourselves. But intercession is praying for others. A great deal of the key is prayer. And I have found that prayer changes me more than it changes God. Today I was praying. They had prayer meeting at 8 o'clock at the campground with the kids. And, and one of the things was I was saying was, God, you show me my part in the solution. Rather than saying, God, save them. I was praying for somebody to be saved. I said, God, show me what I'm supposed to do to help ensure they're saved. Because a lot of times, I'm praying for God to do something. And he's saying, I wish you would just ask me to use you. In Acts 2 and 42, it reads, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread and of prayers. So let us let God lead us. Part of this freedom, Hebrews 10 and 25, is assembling of ourselves together. That's one of the tools that we have. John 5 and 39 says, Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they that testify of me. Ecclesiastes 8 and 4 says, Where the word of the ki a king is, there is power. And who may say to him, What are you, you doing? And finally, Isaiah 55 and 11 says, So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. We can't have victory over circumstance. If you fall, get back up. And the next time you face that thing, and you see yourself going down the wrong path, do something to stop it. Dear Jesus, I pray for your spirit today. We need a renewing of your spirit. We need a renewing of our minds. Let your Holy Spirit talk to the innermost being of each one of us that are gathered in this place.
I entreat your throne, Lord, that the word that has been hidden in our hearts would come alive, that it would burst forth, that it would shine forth. Lord, we need your word that's hidden in our heart. Give us a hunger for your word. Give us a passion for spiritual things. And I pray, Lord, just as tonight, every time we gather together, that we would feel the strength strength of the body of Christ, that we would feel the compound spiritual power of one putting a thousand and two putting ten thousand to flight. I speak to the spirits of darkness that have worked against the people that are gathered in this house. We rebuke you in Jesus' name. I lose freshness. We lose authority. We lose a renewal of the mind and a renewal of the spirit that we will go forth from this place uh, with joy and gladness uh, and with comfort in our hearts uh, and courage in our spirit, uh, saying the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. We take your sword of the Spirit, uh, which is the Word of God. We take your Word and it will not return void. It will do exactly what it is intended to do, uh, to banish the enemy, uh, to, to clear the way, uh, to heal the sick and the lame and the blind and the halt uh, and to give anointing let fresh anointing fall that's it let's open our spirit to him uh, cry out to him for what you have need of uh, tell God uh, this is where my weakness is I see it uh, I ask for strength God uh, I ask for you to strengthen me by my sp your spirit uh, give me brothers and sisters to walk alongside me uh, Hallelujah. Oh, I love you, Jesus. Thank you for the visitation of your spirit. Thank you for the tools to overcome. Thank you for the power to overcome. Thank you for the anointing of your spirit. Renew your spirit in me. Renew your authority in me. Renew my mind. Refresh my mind. We'll take dominion. Nothing shall by any means hurt us. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I receive your word. I embrace it. You'll never leave us. You'll never forsake us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Ah, oh, thank you for your spirit. Said, let him put strength in you right now. I feel virtue coming from heaven. Uh, it's not time for the gifts, but it's time for empowerment. Start thanking Him for it. Thank you, God, for renewing my strength. Thank you for causing me to mount up with wings as eagles. I'm going to bind myself to you. I'm going to wait on you. I'm going to tie myself around. I'm going to hang on to you. Because in doing so, God, you will lift me up. Yes, release your strength. We release freshness into the house. Release strength. Thank you, Lord. That's it. Let him pour it into you. You need it. I need it. We're going to do all we can to stand. I'm going to live for you, God. I'm going to hang on to your love. I'm going to learn to love you better. I'm going to learn to show that I love you by obeying your command. Thank you, 
Oh, I thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Jesus said, my peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. <laughs> 